Hi, and welcome to the Design Systems Podcast, the place where design and development overlap. Brought to you by Knapsack. Check us out at knapsack.cloud. So, hey, everybody. Today, I'm here with Audrey Tan. She's the Director of Product Design at Zero. We've been talking a little bit about life, the universe, and everything. Really excited to have you on uh, and to chat about some of the the really incredible stuff you guys have done with culture and intention around design systems. Thanks so much. Happy to be here, Chris. So diving right in, one of the things that I think was was interesting about kind of the the notes before the show was this idea of the intention setting behind a design system. So a lot of times when you think about how design systems get created, how they evolve, is you you have an insurgency, you have some team or some group of people, maybe a solo designer, maybe a developer, a product owner that basically says, my life would be so much easier if I had a system to manage all the stuff that's being thrown my way. Um, what you guys have done is kind of taken that in, in uh, uh, another direction, maybe a more elevated position of, we actually wanna look at, at from an organization perspective, what do we get out of our design system? And how do we set some broad intentions about that that is company-wide? Tell me a little bit about that. Yes, at Zero, um, as of a year ago, we had sort of two designers full-time on our design system team. Our design system is called, um, we call it Zooey, which is spelled X-U-I. Um, Zero has this thing with, we love our X's and we just put them in front of everything. But so Zooey as our design system only a year ago had about two people. And when we talk about intentionality, it was really kind of the time that crossroads where we're like, yeah, we want a design system, but not just because we want to help increase developer velocity or because everybody else who's cool has one, but we really want it to work for us. And so since then, we've scaled it from a team of two designers to more than a dozen. Um, and it's an actual like pod with uh, some, some product managers that really actually within the past year have set what we would call like a design systems vision that really encapsulates what it is that we hope to achieve from it kind of three to five years out from now. Gotcha. So you have this this pod. So tell me a little bit more about that. Is that like, is that like a formal structure in the organization? What does that actually mean? Yeah. So it's an actual team that's dedicated solely to the success of Zooey and sort of the use of Zooey across Zero and ultimately for our customers. So the pod is comprised of um, about eight engineers um, and about a dozen or so designers and uh, managers who actually do sprints, right? So like they um, will identify a need, whether it's to um, shiny up a component or maybe the need actually has to do with more like evangelism and getting more people across uh, Zooey. But yeah, it's a fully dedicated team. Gotcha. So that fully dedicated team then, there's sort of mission is now this this three to five year plan around what the the intention setting is for the design system and and some outcomes you guys are hoping to achieve. Talk to me a little bit about like that that formation process. So you have two designers that go to 12 designers. You have an informal structure that goes to a formal structure. What does the outcome of that that planning process look like? Yeah, so the outcome I think has for us has been a more real just group of bodies and team that the rest of Zero Design can sort of look to to tap into. And how that manifests in um, an example is I had a designer on my team and and he's like, you know, I'm not really sure how to incorporate and do this like brand refresh for this other part of the platform. How should I do it? And it was like, well, let's connect with Zach on the Zooey team. Uh, we had a really great meeting, formed the Slack channel, and it's now like opened up just lines of communication. I also think that it's it's really given all of Zero, not just designers, but engineers and product people sort of an anchor is to like belief that we really have um, committed with bodies and people, really smart people to make their lives easier. And it's just mm -hmm. a matter of like, you know, putting in the effort to, to tap into the work that they're doing, um, you know, whether that's by, by going into office hours and things like that. But it's really, really yielded some great results. So I love that that phrase you used where it's it's gotten people to believe in the commitment of zero to to a better workplace. I think that that's something that that in particular I latched onto largely because that commitment is representative in resources towards this system. And so it sounds like the goal of the system for for you guys is yes, it's in service of customers, but it's also in service of the people that work at zero. 
in trying to make their lives better and easier. And I kind of brought that up in, in the starting point, right? How, you know, most design systems are an insurgency because somebody is trying to make their own life easier by creating a system where one never was present before. You guys are basically talking about that on a, a company wide scale of like, let's make our lives better by continuing to invest in this design system. That's right. And I think that an example of how it's not just a singular group, but one of, I would say, one of the themes of the vision that we we were able to articulate this past year was having a co-ownership model. And so as as a theme to this vision, it's it's sort of us saying, you know, this is a saying that we really care about, including that person who is championing accessibility, including maybe even like the 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 people the PX person, the the people of zero person to make sure that we're designing a system that is inclusive and 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 truly feeling actual very global, which I think is kind of unique to zero because we have customers in so many different countries. It's really important that we have this sort of like co-ownership, whether you're a designer in the US sort of representing kind of what you believe people in the US kind of want more from a design system, some mm. of the standards that we might have that might be differing for some, from different countries. And so, yeah, I, I definitely think that it's been um, really great just to get eyes and yeah, people kind of like rallying around a design system is more than just something that makes a developer ship faster. <laughs> totally. I, I think that that's actually kind of speaks to your guys' origin and nature. I mean, being a, a company out of New Zealand, like just by the very nature of, of New Zealand, you, know, you kind of have to be a global organization. And so I love the idea of taking a bunch of different teams that are beyond developers and designers and incorporating those other stakeholders into uh, the co-ownership of that design system. You know, how did that really get kicked off? I'm, I'm curious how you get like a, a team that's focused on on localization or internationalization or a team that's focused on accessibility to really join in the the pact of the design system. I think first off, you just have to take a breath and and realize sort of like kind of what you want to achieve. And I think that, you know, from that, you're able to sort of organically get names and faces and understand what these names and faces mean in terms of like what their commitment, what their role is at the company. So, for example, um, looping in someone like myself who, um, you know, I don't represent just like my specific portfolio of like, you know, billing and automation and things like that. But I also represent sort of a designer in the U.S., right? And so Mm -hmm. identifying those stakeholders and being very intentional about um, like making that list of people that you want to include. And sometimes the list can be kind of long and big, but actually being very smart about what that person brings to the table, being mindful of sort of like their time, time zones, is that's also a thing. Right. Um, but I think it really kind of starts from that. And I think that uh, what I was really, really impressed with our, about our process is, you know, it was just a lot of like whiteboarding, you know, like we love our, our, our virtual whiteboards now um, of people just writing in everything of what they want out of the design system, what their expectations are, bringing in their different perspectives. And I thought it was a really good example of that divergent thinking that, you know, designers like to, to, to sort of like, you know, talk about. And so a lot of a lot of that brainstorming, a lot of that iteration, and it actually happened over a very specific, we, it was over a sprint that we did this. And so it was, it wasn't just, you know, like, oh, let's just try this and like see how it rolls. But it was very much like, this is, there's the beginning and an end to the sprint. And at the end of it, you know, this is what we hope to sort of like have that we can, again, it's that is not like the end result or goal. Obviously, you you still keep massaging over, you know, but like we came out with like five sort of like principles or pillars of the co-ownership model being one of those. And so, um, yeah, it was it was a really collaborative process. So when you think about like what happens in that sprint, right? So you took this this finite amount of time, handful of weeks. And you basically said, we're going to go and we're going to source collaborators. We're going to develop a set of, of baseline principles. What did that process look like? Right. So that process was a lot of using the virtual whiteboards um, and people just kind of being creating that safe space where people can, where people brought their own sort of passions and, and priorities um, and some of the priorities probably actually didn't make the cut. So I think part of that process was also sort of, um, it was an exercise to help prioritize also the things that we, we wanted to focus on. So there was a priority exercise 
And then another part of that process, which I really enjoyed, which was we actually um, had a board that represented a press release of what Zero wanted, like would have run with in like the year 2024 of like, hey, Zero's launched this amazing design system. What do we want that press release to say about us? And we actually like it was um, it was like with. I don't know, one of like the big tech publications and it was broken down into like, what's the headline? What's the sub headline? What are some of the quotes that we want to include as part of this press release? And so I actually think that that was a really great specific exercise to get people to focus ahead and actually get excited about, um, you know, what we want our design system to say literally in like, you know, a couple years. That's awesome. So you guys actually like constructed um, a reality um, that you then like used as as basically that that north star to move towards. Absolutely, yeah. And having it sort of be grounded in the actual st- structure of a press release, I think was it was kind of fun. Um, and really, it you know it can inject a lot of like, hey, now I actually get it. You know, it's not just like a strategy on a page with boxes and words. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, okay, someone someone not at zero would be able to read this and sort of understand what, what it is that we have achieved, which is awesome. That's great. I think that's a nice, like, concrete deliverable for a planning process like that that is a little outside the box. You know, as another part of this, like, one of the big things that you you guys constructed was – you know, this this visioning statement and beyond that visioning statement, uh, a couple of practical principles that would apply to it. I think the principles as a g- way of grounding decision making about a design system are very powerful and that not everybody can be involved in every decision that is made about a design system. And when, you know, you're absent from that decision process, the principles are that that guiding rubric for how to make the right decision uh, about the way forward. Um, talk to me a little bit about those principles because, you know, co-ownership being the first of many, uh, what else did you guys come up with and kind of give me a sense of why? Yeah, absolutely. So another one of the principles was that we want our design system to be expressive. Um, and I think that it was really great to have this principle in there as, as a nod to us showing others that this isn't just about the software. You know, this isn't just about the experience of a customer who's actually purchased Xero. This is about the whole experience of like, I hear about Xero in an advertisement. I see something. Um, I go to the dot com and having sort of the branding and the way that our voice and tone tie into this whole product. Um, So I really liked that word expressiveness um, to Mm -hmm. sort of, as like I said, a way to make sure that brand is also part of this system, right? So is are all of those digital touch points, the the marketing side of things, the product side of things, the you know partner channel side of things, is all of that a part of the design system in in the way that it's currently thought of? So I would describe that as a work in progress for us, but that's essentially why we have this principle is because you know, organizationally at zero, it sometimes might feel that the marketing department is a bit more together and in terms of just even how they do their illustrations. And what we want to do is move towards a place where how we express ourselves at zero is consistent from the moment someone, you know, hears about us on the dot com all the way through when they actually use our platform to send an invoice that, you know, all the all the things that we love as designers, the the colors, the tones, the little border radiuses, that it's all like one cohesive feeling so that, you know, and we're able to use the design system effectively to dial up and dial down the different, you know, like how strongly do we want our zero voice to be at this point of this customer's journey? So mm-hmm. that was another uh, pillar that I, I really appreciated. And if I could talk about another pillar, that's probably my personal favorite. It's this shared commitment to quality. Mm-hmm. And I think it kind of builds on the co-ownership model because if you don't have co-ownership and if you don't have a commitment to quality, then suddenly you can get maybe a situation where it's just like one group sort of being like the Nazi and I'm going to hold the keys to the kingdom kind of thing. So, so when you think about like the the application of that quality standard, that is a shared commitment to quality is also a representation of a more federated model for contribution, like where you don't have that that singular person that is in control or that singular group that's in control 
you share that control in a federated manner and everybody needs to to still maintain that quality standard. Is that kind of like akin to what you're going for there? Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds great, but if you think about it, it's really a challenge to achieve, right? Because it requires probably more a commitment to doing check-ins and actually being more, more upfront with somebody who's not using a design pattern the way that you know they really should be or you know the component that we're building isn't quite meeting the needs that it it, you know, across like a couple different use cases. So I think it requires a bit of honesty there, but that's why I really am, appreciate the fact that we have this in there as, as a way to sort of break into some of what might be some challenging conversations around like needing to push something a little bit harder. So I think that's awesome that you have this idea of this federated model that is a commitment to quality. It allows you to have conversations that you wouldn't normally be able to have largely based upon that value. What else did you guys come up with as a part of this? So another one of our principles really is around um, having strong technical foundations. Um, So you got to acknowledge the importance of picking the right tools, making sure that people know how to use the tools the right way, um, and realizing that it's not just about developer tools, right? Mm -hmm. It could be about tools for someone on like our content team. Like we have a dedicated content team at Zero. Like how can we make sure that they have the right tools so that their workflows all make sense and are contributing to the design system? And it's sort of like what I like about these principles, it's, it's sort of like they they kind of like stack on top of each other. So there's like the co-ownership model, the commitment to quality, the technical foundations. And it's sort of like if you don't have like the prior, the, the following becomes a bit more difficult, you know, and it's like, we with the technical foundations, it's it's not just about tooling. It's 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 also just giving people sort of the ability to feel free to to inject like the art into the technical aspect of what they do, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we just wanted to make sure that like our technical foundations were such that we could give everybody in their own discipline sort of the ability to control their own destiny, if that makes sense. Um, to sort of like set them free let them contribute, um, sort of have have what can be hard about design systems in terms of process and overheads just sort of disappear. That's interesting. Like, it seems like you guys really value that autonomy as a part of the the intentionality and the, and the really the foundations for this system. And that seems to have played out really well in, in the actual implementation. Can you talk about some of how, like, you guys live these principles in terms of of the delivery of the design system to the organization? Yeah, sure. So I would say a specific way that we're kind of leveraging this is with um, kind of a a strategic initiative we have at Zero to really kind of modernize our platform. (laughs) And I feel like if you worked at a a SaaS company that's older than 10 years old, Mm -hmm. someone's someone's going to be asking the question or someone's going to identify the need of like, hey, you know, maybe it's time to um, go into the engine and, and revamp a couple things. And so I think that Um, As part of this initiative at Zero to sort of like modernize parts of the platform, you know, obviously with that comes, you know, this end experience of like what the users are touching and feeling in the software. And so with Zooey, it's really kind of it's, it's nice to have these principles because now that we're all trying to modernize, we're able to use these principles to give us guidelines as to make sure that, um, we're sort of like playing and contributing in the way that we're supposed to, right? Like, I'm not going to go rogue. I'm going to, I'm going to, but I'm also not going to expect someone else to do it for me. You know, Mm -hmm. like I'm going to contribute myself. I'm going to be collaborative in this process. That's really great. I think that that uh, concept of play was a a big conversation that we recently had with, with Jess Clark. And I, I love that that word comes out over and over again in these conversations where People want that playground, that experimentation area, that that sandbox that they can test out their ideas within a defined set of constraints that means they aren't completely, you know, like you said, over in in some foreign land, uh, not working on the same product, uh, but still have this this sense of, of adventure and exploration. Right. And I think especially as, as designers, we, we crave that that allowance for creativity Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes I think a lot of us forget the importance of injecting that into our day to day. But, you know, through tooling and, you know, whether you're the type of designer that just loves loves the tools and wants to know what the latest and greatest and play around, you know, it's like we want to encourage that. But in a way where we're still sort of 
moving the needle, you know, getting everybody sort of like closer to this end state where we could even achieve what we what we actually wrote in that press release. It also seems like that press release is really cross-functional because you have content, you have engineering, you have design, you have product ownership, you have all these different things that are a part of this this pod ecosystem you've talked about. So tell me about that enablement of cross-functional workflow because traditionally getting designers and developers is harder enough to to put them in a place where they they feel like they can work comfortably together but then all of a sudden you're adding marketing people and content people and all these other folks to this ecosystem that absolutely should be there but even crossing that that boundary of like designer developer collaboration is very challenging for a lot of businesses how did you guys really look at that that challenge of getting all these different stakeholder groups to really collaborate and work together and how did that play out? Yeah, so I would describe it as still very much a work in progress. And I think that first, it's about the designer developer. And then even with product, I feel like. So if you're going to visualize sort of like a stakeholder group as like these concentric circles, right? It's like you have this core group of stakeholders that probably need to like get it first and foremost. And then once you have that right, you're able to sort of branch out and then have conversations. And so to be fair, I would say Zero is at a place where we're still working on like that classic, you know, tripod of like product um, design and engineering. Mm -hmm. However, but with the way that um, Zero is, it's like within design, we have research and we have um, we have content. So it, it's really just about kind of being proactive with those conversations and having a good memory to what you took away in that conversation, because you might have that conversation, but realizing the output might not be able to happen for, you know, a good six months, maybe even a year. But it, I, to me, I feel like it's really important that we kind of have um, the perseverance and the fortitude and like the patience to sort of still realize that as, as much as it's a work in progress, like I know that it's still very important that we get to a place where the cross collaboration between me as a product designer and a designer on the marketing team is so smooth and seamless that like imagine a world where we could essentially ship, you know, the the new sort of like guide to a new product sort of like, I don't know, instantly, like how cool would that be? Right. And so it's about sort of like staying commitment, staying committed to that journey and that end state. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a work in progress, but I, I would say it helps when you really enjoy the people you work with. And as much as like, global, <laughs> you know, like I, yeah, Zero is a, is a company based in New Zealand. And so I work with a lot of Kiwis and Aussies and they're just delightful. And so it sort of helps. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I think that what's interesting to hear you talk about, you know, the journey that you're on and how it's an ongoing process. It sounds a lot like culture building. It sounds a lot like talking about how you want to create a culture that is about this collaboration, about this federated model, about the principles that you define. And by defining that culture, by definition, you're going to be putting people on this this journey, on this pathway towards this very intentional future you've set for yourself. I think that's a really interesting model for not just design system work, but adoption about growth, about exploration, all those different things. You know, was that was that the intent from the beginning? Because it's a, a pretty awesome way of being in a company as it as it relates to a design system. Yeah, you know what? I I will say I believe that was the intent. Because when I think about where we are now and where we still have yet to go, it's been an amazing process, not because we can necessarily brag about, you know, moving KPIs and stuff like that, like, it, but it's, it's been, it's been nice to see a few tangible examples of how it's really manifesting in terms of shipping product that I as a designer that my team feels proud of mm -hmm. right and it and it's sort of like as part of it it's not just about shipping that pretty thing but it's being able to say to yourself oh it's because we went through this process of committing to a design system with the intention of just not making it like you know not making it faster for engineers but like I keep saying but really making it kind of better for all and it and it's it sounds almost a little kind of like utopian, you know, sort of like in this paradise <laughs> world. But um, I, I do think that, you know, you got to hang on to a little bit of that um, sort of like um, thinking sort of in the ideal and just like 
doing the grind every day to like commit doing your part to like kind of making it happen as part of the design system. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely does sound like you're, you're living a little bit in Elysium. I, I, but I think that's amazing. Right. I think that, that thinking about what's possible with a cultural definition around the idea of this, this collaborative process. Um, I think that's also interesting because in my head, I, I've been through this conversation trying to think about like which one came first, right? Like this, this chicken and the egg idea of like a systems based view of the way that you think about building software and a brand and expressing that brand or this this commitment as a culture to having this system to to leverage to make all these things work well together. And I think that that's kind of a little bit brilliant that that's a, a, a little bit of a flywheel just in, in my brain right there where one feeds the other and that feeds back into the first. I think that that's a, a cool way of looking at a system and thinking about how that culture of people relates to that system. Totally. You know, like the chicken or the egg question, the answer, I feel like it doesn't matter, but it's what's more important is that we're thinking about the wheel and and really just pursuing outcomes that are better for the customer, that are better for us as people who work on the design systems, you know, that we have those wins. Um, but yeah, I totally agree with you. It's, it's an interesting one. And, and, you know, whether at zero, like it was the chicken or the egg, I think just believing, you know, back to that word belief, that what really matters is 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 the contribution. It's the build. It's that creativity. It's that process. Mm -hmm. That's what kind of inspires me. That's awesome. When you think about taking that inspiration and applying it to to what's next, either professionally or personally, like where do you take that inspiration and, and run with it outside of this immediate like work with the design system team? I guess for me, when I sit down at my computer every day, whether it's because I'm dialing into work or I'm needing to do like a Zoom call with a friend or mm -hmm. something like that. I think how how it inspires me is really just being able to maintain that perspective and just be kind of chill about, you know, the it's like there's this this is terrible, Chris. I'm, I'm not going yeah, to like, fine. Get, articulate this in a way that's like not too. Oh, we get woo woo up on this show. What is woo woo? <laughs> I don't even like, know what that is. The the whole idea of like of like like shamanism and the woo woo ness and everything okay. like that. Like yeah, oh, okay. dive in. No, yeah. um, yeah, this is gonna sound super like meta and cheesy, but I've been really lately been focused on this idea of for me personally wanting to just be okay with. I don't want to use the word failure because I don't really view them as failures. It's sort of just like missed, missed deadlines, missed like expectations that one had that didn't necessarily come to fruition and sort of, I guess, being OK with that. And and I guess maybe <laughs> maybe the way to tie it into the design system here is our last pillar is embrace the chaos Um our last principle of our design system is embrace the chaos. That's and awesome. I think that's probably the thing that I am, you know, especially having moved in the pandemic, the pandemic itself, just the chaos, right? And being able to have systems, delight in my systems, in my like tiny little system of like my daily breakfast routine or, or whatever it is. Um, but then still be able to zoom out, pan out and say, yeah, life is chaotic. And this this part of my life might not be completely in line with what I imagined it being, you know, at the point I am in my career. But just being OK with that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Finding some sort of, of acceptance and some peace about it all. I think that that's cool. It's a very like mindfulness driven idea is that, you know, um, you can kind of control what you can control. And then it's about understanding how those other things just kind of flow through you. Yeah. I think that that's a good way to put it, a better way to put it, um, to let it flow. Um, sometimes I like to describe myself to other people as like, I'm like water, <laughs> um, can truly kind of go with the flow. I don't think I was always like this. I think I was probably more so like, no, we have to have a system and that there needs to be controls and I need to have control. But I think to, to make it really kind of about life and like, yeah, I guess mindfulness is a way, a good way to describe it. It's, I think for me personally, um, yeah, embrace the chaos, have a system, but you know, embrace the chaos too. 
And I think that what's interesting is that, you know, when you think about leading a design system effort or leading a design system team, I think that the ability to to absorb that and to to find that piece inside of like what is typically a pretty chaotic <laughs> process is probably a good thing. I think I, honestly, if you try to white knuckle it through through a design system implementation, you drive yourself crazy. Um, yeah. and, and so I think that that there is a a bit of of peace to be found inside of of embracing that chaos and and realizing that not everything about the system is controllable, largely because you want other people to own it. And they're not always going to think about it or or approach it the same way that you are. Right. That's very true. When you say white knuckling, I was recalling what my colleague Zach was saying of um, he's like, yeah, we're definitely flying the plane while building it. Or what's what's that analogy? We're 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 building the car while driving the car. Yeah. And it's chaotic. Um, If you plan, it's like, oh, ideally, you have all the time to really think through every move. Um, but in reality, I feel like, especially with design system is it just, it doesn't work that way. And so as much as, you know, dot your I's and cross your T's, just being able to say like, okay, this is, this is where we are now and this is good enough for now. And we're going to still commit to quality obviously, but, um, like it's okay. And like, let's just keep moving, keep swimming. Awesome. Well, Audrey, uh, been a real pleasure to talk to you. I hope as you continue down this journey, uh, you continue to find that that peace and acceptance and uh, are able to just keep swimming. Yeah, man. Thank you. That's all for today. This has been another episode of the Design Systems Podcast. Thanks for listening. Our producers are Ryan Peterson and Shana Hodkin. Our musical composer is Wes Willis. Our editor is Zach Barkas. If you have any questions or a topic you'd like to know more about, find us on Twitter at the DS Pod. We'd love to hear from you with show ideas, recommendations, questions, or comments. As always, this pod is brought to you by Knapsack. You can check us out at knapsack.cloud. Have a great day.